morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you all are joining us from. Um, my name is Lauren Van Meter, and I would like to get us started with a warm welcome by the National Democratic Institute to both our attendees in the room um, and those in line. NDI is privileged to provide a forum um, for Rebecca Shute and Citizens for Global Security, um, as well as her sister organization, the World Federalist Movement, for a discussion on establishing a permanent standing peacekeeping service and a gender sensitive approach. Some may wonder why an organization that supports democracy and governance will be supporting an event on peacekeeping, but I think at its core, um, our institutions share a common interest and in principles of accountability, the rights, and governance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you so much to all of our hosts at NDI. Um, I have to say that it's a particular and personal privilege to be back here almost 20 years after I began my career at the National Democratic Institute. And while some things have changed, certainly there's been some renovations and upgrades, um, certainly the ethos and the commitment and the passion of NDI staff and the resonance of its mission remains today. Um, so today's program is born out of the recognition that for decades, my organization and its counterpart, along with many others in the global community, have been working for sustainable peace solutions. And what we have found over preceding years and with precedents from UN peacekeeping forces um, and endeavors to date, is that there are quite a lot of lessons to be learned, positive, negative, good, bad, and ugly. And so here we are today to discuss the gender implications, the victim-centric approaches, and the community-based models that could be applied to something like a United Nations Emergency Peace Force. And to chair our session today, it is my privilege to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Augusto Lopez Claros, who is the Executive Director of Global Governance Forum. He's an international economist, economist excuse me, with more than 30 years of experience in international organizations, including most recently at the World Bank, and for the 2018-2019 academic years, he was on leave in the World Bank as a senior fellow at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And I'm afraid, Augusto, if I went through the rest of your bio, I don't think we would have any time for the interventions from the floor or discussion. So if you'll forgive me for abridging um, your wonderful experience, and I give the floor to you. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for being brief in the, in the presentation. I want to divide my remarks today in two parts. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the idea of establishing a, a peace force. And then I want to jump into the, the, the whole gender dimension, which I know is your primary interest. Um, actually, if you go back, this idea of establishing uh, some kind of international military force or peace force is, is actually more than a century old. Um, in the discussions that took place leading up to the creation of the League of Nations, there was actually an active debate about, about you know, creating such a force. In fact, um, the former prime minister of uh, France, Mr. Léon Bourgeois, who is seen by many as the father of the League of Nations, um, perhaps together with Woodrow Wilson, you know, in the in the draft of the covenant that was ultimately, you know, the founding document for the for the League, you know, there is the idea of of creating an international peace force. That would actually be, a perm, you know, would have a permanent international staff. It would, it would be, um, you know, organized in a, in a multilateral basis. It would be in charge of training, implementation, deciding you know, when to intervene, and, and so on. Um, and in fact, at that time, perhaps because we were in the middle of World War One, there was a great deal of uh, um, sense of, uh, you know, tragedy uh, against the 18 million fatalities of that conflict. You find that in the public debate, there was a great deal of openness about contemplating, you know, these ambitious proposals, and uh, you know, very, very much strong support for it. Since in France, there were a number of polls that were done about quite principle for the idea of establishing a peace force. But eventually, the idea died because President Wilson and Robert Cecil uh, in the United Kingdom, you know, were opposed. I don't think they were opposed. To the idea in principle, I think that we're looking at the political ramifications. As you know, Wilson had a problem with the U.S. Senate here in the, in the U.S., and so he said it's unlikely that the U.S. public would ever agree, you know, to have, uh, let's say, um, uh, 
you know, controlled by some international body of, you know, uh, U.S. military uh, forces. And so the idea died down as regards the, the league. But it was there in the in, in very much in the public debate. Leon Bourgeois was given the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2000, in, in 1920. And, you know, he remained very active in the debate. And 12 years later, at the disarmament conference in Geneva, the war minister, as they used to call them in those days, for France, actually resuscitated the whole idea, except that this time even more ambitious. He said that all major weapon systems of all the members of the League have to be set aside and used only under a League mandate and an international force created you know, in a system of compulsory arbitration. Right? Um, at that time, Albert Einstein was very active in these debates and he strongly supported these French initiatives. And I'd just like to share with you something that he said at that time, which I thought is so insightful. You know, we think of Einstein as the great physicist, but, you know, we very seldom uh, think of him as the great public statesman that he was at the same time. And he said, in discussing these issues, it matters a great deal how you frame the question. And he said, at the moment, the question in policy debates and so on is the following. He says, under what conditions are armaments permissible and how wars should be fought? And he said, that's the wrong question. The question should really be, are nations prepared to submit all international disputes to the judgment of an arbitration authority established by the consent of all parties seeking to establish security guarantees? And if you frame the question from that perspective, then the debate takes, you know, takes on, on a different path. In any case, that was the league. The debate was resuscitated again in the early 1940s after the creation of the United Nations. Um, I, I found it um, quite amazing that in 1943-1944, you know, when the draft of the UN Charter was being put together, and Article 43 was already in it, which basically says that nations are going to make available to the Security Council forces, military forces, prevention and its purposes, the U.S. government at that time was considering or was, was thinking, what kind of a commitment are we going to make to this Article 43? And the kind of thinking that was taking place in the State Department and within the defense establishment was we're going to make 300,000 troops available. We're going to make 2,000 aircraft, 2,000 plus aircraft available. So, you know, when you when you look at the history later on, you know, it seems amazing that they were thinking in such grand scale uh, form. But, you know, they took the, their commitments to the UN Charter seriously. And uh, I don't need to tell you that nothing of, a, of, of that sort ever came, came back, <laughs> came forward. Russell, Bertrand Russell, who together with Einstein and Clark were very active in those debates at that time, said something which I think remains true to today and will remain true for the foreseeable future. Russell, a philosopher, he was a mathematician, a mathematician, he was a logician. And this statement seems like a mathematical theorem, and I just want to share it with you. I, I love it because it's so so um, persuasive. He said, "Wars will cease when and only when it becomes evident beyond reasonable doubt that in any war the aggressor the aggressor will be defeated." And coming from that from that vantage point, Russell and Grenville Clark and Einstein at that time when they when the UN Charter was about to be adopted desperately making the case, we need to have an international peace force in parallel with the process of disarmament. Right? The two need to go hand in hand to create the kind of um, environment in which the UN would be able to deliver on its peace and security, security promises. Okay, now moving on. Um, let me, you know, the, 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 the historically women have not been allowed to join the ranks of the military. You know that very well. Um, you know, we're coming out of a period of literally hundreds of years where essentially war, war fighting, the military was essentially a male domain. Even today, um, when you look at the U.S. and Canadian military, 17% are, are women, 83% are men. In China, 5%. In the India, depending on what service you look at, you know, the Air Force, the, 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 you know, the Marine and so on, is somewhere between 4 and 14%. So we still live in a world in which the military is essentially a male-dominated uh, uh, sort of province. Now, 
why is it that the issue of gender in the military you know is actually a very important consideration as we move forward into the future and here i want to share with you some very interesting facts they are partly drawn from studies that have been done um, they are drawn from my own insights as an economist working for many years at the world bank all right and i just want to quickly quickly share with you and then come back to, to, to the issue of uh, uh, gender from the military perspective um, we know from data uh, compiled actually at the World Bank uh, in the department of which I was the head for many, many years until recently, that <clears throat> countries that have more forms of discrimination against women, you know, through the law, embedded in the law, you know, we have a huge database at World Bank that captures this for 190 countries, they tend to be countries that are in greater conflict. Um, the Gender Equality and Governance Index, which brings together something like 80 indicators into a ranking of 158 countries, if you look at the 17 worst performers in the index, in other words, the countries where, where the gender gap is the biggest, where there is greater discrimination, where the condition of women is the worst, Iran, Afghanistan, and, and you know, I won't give you the list, but you can imagine it, right? 14 out of 17 countries, right? Are, uh, are are basically conflict conflict related countries. In other words, there is this connection between you know persecuting and discriminating against women on the one hand and the, the prevalence of conflict. We know that the, the the higher the participation of women in parliament, we have data for a large number of countries, the the greater the number of of uh, um, the, the greater the the, the, the participation of women. In, yeah. Parliament, the less the, 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 the incidents of human rights abuses, torture, killing, disappearances, you know, all kinds of other, other horrible calamities. We know from the criminology data that populations in jails are, are largely male populations. Right? It, it, at the World Bank, we have plenty of data that suggests that in general, you know, uh, men are more prone to violence, more prone to violence. They're also more corrupt, by the way, that they become tough very, very, very much. There have been a number of studies done on women in the police, um, police forces uh, here in the US, currently. They are less likely to use violence. They are better able to reduce tension and forms that do not involve shooting people, killing them. Um, there have been uh, studies done looking at 40 peace processes in 35 countries. Um, and the result is very, very clear. The greater the number of women's involvement in negotiations, the more likely to have lasting, lasting agreements. And the classic case of this is the Good Friday Agreement of Ireland in 1998. You know, the, the, the story there is, is, is really quite fascinating. Um, Catholic and, and Protestant women came together, they, they formed a political party. They won a few seats uh, in, the, in the parliamentary election. They got a table at the a seat at the table of the negotiations where the where the peace treaty was 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 eventually uh, agreed, and people have gone back to the to the minutes because these were informal peace negotiations. But you know, no, people, there were no takers, and so you know exactly who said what when, right? Over a period of many many weeks, and it's really fascinating to study. Whereas the men were generally interested in, you know. Um, Sort of where is the limit going to be, or or you know who's going to take care care of the weapons, or you know who was responsible for that bomb on that year, that month that killed twenty people, right? You know, looking at issues of the past and attribution of responsibility and guilt. The women, whenever they intervene in the negotiations, they were more interested in um, um, how are we going to improve the the job opportunities for our young people. You know, where are the resources going to come to boost uh, investment in education and so on. Forward looking. Um, it generally thinking in terms of the welfare of the community, right? And, and I think this kind of studies, I am from this eventually precipitated, you know, the Security Council Resolution 1325, which called for the greater involvement of the of women. I think that if you have armies and the military where you have more of a presence, women, um, you know, surely they, they will be better able to help female victims of sexual crimes and gender-based violence, which, uh, which as you know, is very much a feature of conflict in, in, in today. And you, you've seen the attack, the attack on October the 7th in Israel by Hamas, 
I don't know whether you've been following the literature, but you know that, that it's evident that rape was used as a, as a weapon during, during those attacks. And then, of course, you are more familiar with the examples of what happened in Papua New Guinea in the 1990s, which I believe somebody will be talking about later today, and then the Liberia Civil War in the 2000s, um, where Christian and Muslim women came together uh, you know, in nonviolent protests to bring that civil war to an end. So whether you look at it from a security point of view, from an economic point of view, I think you know societies are, are likely to gain a great deal from the greater participation of women um, in in um, in this kind of discussion and 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 uh, and you know certainly certainly in terms of of the economy. What kind of things would I like to just to conclude? What kind of things would I like to see you know in the future moving forward? Um, well, uh, I think it would be nice if our military was more open to the participation of women and in particular um, in in the UN context uh, uh, among peacekeepers. Um, I think that part of the abuses and the, and the, and the um, um, you know incidents of, uh, of rape and uh, abuse of women partly reflects that the, the peacekeeping forces, by and large, have been you know very much male male in composition. I think that if you had more women in them, you know you would alienate some of those problems. You would have more women who would take up more vigilant role in uh, you know trying to prevent those calamities from happening. Um, I think that um, it would be nice to see the promotion of women within peacekeeping forces to leadership positions. Um, at the moment, if you look at the structure of the leadership within the peacekeeping forces, it's very much male-dominated. And, and just more generally, you know, stepping back from, from the military itself, and if you just look at, at you know, what the data is saying about the discrimination against women in the world, uh, although we have made progress in the last, say, 20, 30 years, um, and again, drawing on studies we have done at the World Bank, you know, we looked at, for instance, the, the status of women in respect to the law in 1960 and in 2010, over a 50 year period. And it, the progress has been remarkable in, in, you know, especially in Africa and in Latin America and many parts of the world, in creating a more level playing field for women. But there is still a huge gap. There is still a long, long way to go. And, and so I tend to look at this as a, half, a, a glass half empty, so to speak. And, and I think that we, we just need to do a great deal more to eliminate many of these discriminations about opportunity because they have dramatic implications. Just to conclude, you know, at the World Bank, when you look at the data for 190 countries, for each country, we have a number that says these are the, the, the ways, in, this is the, these are the number of ways in which the country is turning women into second class citizens. So in Iran, that number is 24. Right? We were able to identify in Iran 24 different ways in which the civil code, the constitution, basically discriminates against women in a very objective way. And because we have this number for 190 countries, we can correlate lots of other things. And what we discovered is that the higher the number of discrimination, the, the, the lower the level force participation. The higher the number of discrimination, the lower the school and low rate of girls. The higher the number of discrimination, the larger the wage gap between men and women. The higher the number of discriminations, the lower the level of women-owned businesses, which tends to impact you know, adversely, entrepreneurship, and so on. So the data is very compelling. Right? So we need to we need to move into a world in which, which uh, we have less male-dominated government structures because we have paid a very high price for that. Many centuries for that. Okay, we live in a more violent world than have been segregated for the second century. Thank you so much, Christo. Um, and as we move from uh, that incredibly edifying and um, provocative set of opening remarks, I'll take the opportunity to do a little housekeeping as we proceed with our agenda and our panelists. Um, we are delighted to be joined online by folks all over the world, as well as in the room here at NDI. Um, this is being recorded, as you will have heard when you join Zoom, but I think it's abundantly clear to those in the room, um, and will be available after the fact um, as well. We, After our panelists, we will move to a discussion portion of the program. We kindly ask those of you online to use the Q&A function. We will be monitoring that. My colleague, Alan Ware, 
Um, we'll be calling on you when it is that time in the program. And for those in the room, obviously, we would love to hear your thoughts and contributions as we open that up. And so we'll switch between online and, um, and in-person interventions. Um, Augusto, would you like to introduce our first speaker, or shall I take that privilege? You. Okay. Um, so our first panelist, uh, due to personal reasons, had to alter her schedule and won't be joining us live, but has graciously recorded her comments to share with us today. Um, Madeline Reese, um, um, an Order of the British Empire, is a lawyer and current Secretary General of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, as well as a visiting professor at UCLA and the London School of Economics. Uh, she was a whistleblower in the Bosnia UN human sex trafficking scandal has worked nationally and internationally to advance human rights, eliminate discrimination, and remove obstacles to justice. In 1998, she was appointed as head of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And while there, she helped expose human rights abuses and the involvement of UN peacekeepers in sex trafficking. And incidentally, in the 2010 film, The Whistleblower, about these events, she was portrayed by none other than Vanessa Redgrave. Uh, so with that, I think we will turn to the filmed intervention by Ms. Madeline Rees. Deepest apologies for not being there in person, but I have got other things that I have to do in terms of the scheduling commitment. Um, but I'm really delighted that you're having this panel. There's so many interesting elements to discussing peacekeeping in its various forms. And I think it's very important, first of all, to just to give an overview very briefly that not all peacekeeping missions are the same. They are made up of different components and they have different mandates, self-evidently mandates coming from the Security Council. And all great intentions, all of them, you know, nobody wants to have an ongoing conflict. So the idea of having a peacekeeping force is to try and keep a peace. Problem number one, there often isn't a peace to keep. There are still warring factions, which somehow inserting a group of people from other countries wearing, <laughs> wearing uniforms, carrying guns, is seen to be one of the answers. But that's not the only model. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the differences of approaches that have been by looking at the Bosnia model and because that's where I have most experience um, to see how and in what way peacekeeping can embed itself within communities and fundamentally change the way in the future of that country in terms of its need for peace can then be influenced by the very presence of those peacekeepers and often in a very negative way. We then have the Bosnia type model where there was a peace agreement and then power was given through that peace agreement to various elements of the United Nations, including the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. And then that enabled part of peacekeeping operations to be a militarized police force, which was essentially there to train the existing police forces. So at any one time at the beginning of the transition from war to peace in Bosnia, there were more than 60,000 men in Bosnia from goodness knows how many different countries wearing different types of uniforms, some military, some police, all of them able to have freedom of movement within a country where nobody else did, um, and ostensibly having mandates which gave a considerable amount of power to those who were in Bosnia um, affecting those mandates. Now, you'd say, well, what's the problem with that? Um, number one, when you've had a conflict too much of it, most of it, nearly all of it is about power, who's got it, how they use it, what they use it for, and how they want to subjugate the other part of the population. If then what you do is you send in yet another set of power holders into that situation, you are creating another set of blockages, if you like, as to who can actually exist and enjoy freedoms underneath that. You're creating, if you like, something against which the domicile population is going to feel at least some antipathy towards. And I have to say, in Bosnia, the number of, of women particularly I spoke to who said, when I first got there, um, they were conflicted because part of them wanted to see an armed convoy going past because they knew that that was going to keep them safe from any possible the possibility of the continuation of the conflict from which they had suffered enormously. But at the same time, it was a convoy of militarized soldiers, soldiers who in a, in a militarized setting, which did two things. One, 
obviously it doesn't make you feel safe if it's been the source of your persecution previously but the other thing it does it causes a disequilibrium within the society itself because the men who are in the domicile population are unhappy about having another bunch of men coming in and exerting more power than they do so you end up with this power situation between competing maleness and masculinity if you like which then does not help to if you like calm the situations down so it's got a sort of a, a social cultural gender dimension which is out with the actual economy and political the, the, and politics of the actual uh, spaces they're trying to create so that's one and then you have in situations like Bosnia and then we can go on and make a list of every single peacekeeping operation you have ever seen and that is none of them have avoided sexual exploitation abuse uh, Bosnia was particularly pernicious because it was not only sexualized violence but it was trafficking for the specific purpose of sexual violence aided abetted and facilitated by UN peacekeepers um it's well documented I think anybody who's been involved in looking at peacekeeping knows of what happened in Bosnia um it was actually not Bosnians who were trafficked in the first place it was women from Moldova, Romania, Ukraine who were brought in specifically to provide the goods, horrifically so-called, for a potential market, which then became a real market as we had all these, these male peacekeepers, so-called, um, in Bosnia. That in and of itself led to massive distortion in the local economies because by and large, just about every village had some form of a cafe a, a bar where women were being held you know, often uh, even even as basic as as um, petrol stations um where women were being held and where predominantly peacekeepers to start off with because nobody else had freedom of movement could go and uh, and use those women and entire communities became dependent on the revenues for, from that activity. So you'd have the local guys who would work in the as, as doormen. You'd have the local guys, taxi drivers. They would go pick up the girls and bring them. So it was a whole industry, which was entirely in the black economy, entirely illegal, entirely unpoliced, of course, which then led to the creation of this black economy in Bosnia, which is still alive and kicking. So it actually led to this incredible economic distortion now we could go on for ages explaining how that then has ramifications for the future economy of a country which is post-conflict but clearly it's it is very negative add in the fact that the you know, essentially then the reputational risk to the United Nations of what it was doing was so he so potentially desperate that there was a massive rush to shut it all down any, any discussion of it, any evidence about it, anybody who was found to have done it was carefully just shoveled off to another mission somewhere else. Enter, stay right, the, one of the other problems, this lack of accountability means that people who have, are suspected of having committed offences or even found of committing offences will then be moved to, could easily be moved to another mission. And that happened on, on several occasions. Um, and as a result, what you're doing is you're pushing the same problems to another country. And one of the reasons I just want to talk a little about accountability, one of the reasons there is none is because of the insistence that it's the troop contributing countries who have to take responsibility for the accountability and prosecution of crimes which are committed by their country men in those countries. And it doesn't happen. They don't even have to report to the UN. So the UN should actually be very clear and say, if there are allegations and if you do not report, you do not send troops to peacekeeping. And one of the reasons I think that's important to say is because so many countries get a lot of money from the UN. It's a big money, and it's part of the GDP of many of these countries, that they are able to send peacekeepers, and so they don't want to not be able to send. So it's not just, please, please, give us, our, give us your troops to go and be peacekeepers. It's more, you know, we can control this. You don't get to send if you don't ensure that your own people are not committing crimes in somebody else's country and having no accountability for it. Yeah. This is, I think, where I come to my much more important point. If we're saying, as, well, I am asserting that it's structural. You can't have a conflict which is militarized always and which has a huge gender dimension and 
creates power in the hands of those who use violence in order to attain it, it's not going to work if you replicate that model at huge expense. So huge expensive peacekeepers following a militarized model, doomed to failure, doomed to have to stay in those countries in perpetuity because you're not going to get peace. So what if, what if we thought it differently? Now, there's so much research that's been done that on the issue of gender equality, which when it's in its reductionist form is basically looking at women and men, it's not, we're not as sophisticated as we need to be, otherwise we wouldn't be talking gender equality, we're talking gender. But anyway, um, if we use the language gender equality, what we're really saying here is that we need to be paying attention to the political economy in communities so that the violence within those communities is undone by moving towards a reduction of the imbalances of power. The research done has shown quite categorically that when that happens, you have more peaceful societies. Well, if we know that, why aren't we giving it the necessary nutrition to make it work? We're talking basically social economic rights. Why is it we're not looking at that from a gender perspective? And if you look at the, you know, the brilliant work of Jackie True and others who have looked at how political economy within the household is so distorted in terms of who owns the house, who owns the tools, who brings in the money, all the rest of it. The work is often done by the women, but the power is held by the male. And it starts there and it spreads then into the rest of the community up to and including who controls the physical power. Change that, you've got a much, more possibility, much greater possibility of reaching uh, peaceful communities. So if we actually put money into those who are real peacemakers by actually doing the changes, doing the social reproduction, holding communities together, you would have fundamental change. And it would not cost in Bosnia 128 million a year, you know, 128 million to do militarized peacekeeping and what, 2 million, 3 million at most to support women's organizations who are actually doing the work on the ground. And even that fizzled out very quickly. But those are little tokenistic things which are not then seen as being valuable because our vision, if you like, is skewed towards looking at a particular way of doing peace building. And it hasn't worked, it doesn't work, but we are still seem determined not to look from a different direction and think, oh, well, what if we did this then? And that's the direction of travel we really need to be pushing it in. We need to look at the economics of it. We need to look at the gender dynamics of it. We need to look at how violence is created and perpetrated and how gender relations are absolutely causal in all of that. And if we could actually have a model which is bottom up, not top down, not for the UN, not for other states to say, this is how you're going to do it. No, create it and then nurture it, support it, and then elevate it. And once we've done all of that, we wouldn't need any men in uniforms to be able to hold a peaceful community together. Thank you so much to Madeline for recording that message for us. Um, we only regret she could not join us in person to engage in the discussion, but I think those stirring remarks have set um, not only a tone, but given us um, some complicated and um, uh, yes, dare I say provocative challenges to, to, to ruminate over as we move through our agenda. Um, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker. And I would like to here acknowledge the important role that NDI has played, not only in, um, in gendering sustainable peace, the, the title of uh, today's session, but looking at every aspect of political and democracy processes from a gender lens. And today's program would not have been possible if not for the championship um, of Lauren Dan Mitra, who we are going to hear from in a moment, and Sandra Papara, who is the director of the Gem Gender, Women, and Democracy program at NBI. Um, so Lauren is the director of Peace, Climate, and Democratic Resilience. She's a peace and security expert, having worked on major diplomatic initiatives, peace and conflict resolution processes at the Pentagon, the State Department, the US Institute of Peace, and the Atlantic Council. She's a leading expert on community and democratic resilience, having conducted research and led field initiatives on building the strength and capacity of communities and governments to resist different forms of shock, such as violent extremism, hybrid warfare, and environmental degradation. Um, Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, 
Rebecca asked me to speak to the importance of gender um, uh, to another peacekeeping outcome, which is political and governance outcomes. Often the participation of women in peace negotiations and peacekeeping operations is spoken of in terms of the peace agreement, that women's participation leads to better peace outcomes through the inclusion of a rights and victims perspective. But I'd really like to speak specifically to another factor, and that is what peacekeeping operations can do to advance gender equality. Um, not just within the security sector, um, where progress has been made, but could be improved, but to understand and fully support how gender equality realized in the security sector can have better political outcomes for women writ large. Um, so I'd like to start with what are the likely political, we're a political risk organization, so what are the likely political outcomes of peace negotiations currently? Um, the first is usually strongman rule. Um, so I have seen terrific research by my former colleague, um, Tom Scherer, that shows how peacekeeping missions, in fact, increase the regime tenure of governments who consent to them, especially as in giving the consent, consent they often negotiate mandates that secure their political longevity. So in other words, peacekeeping mandates, as Scherer proved empirically, can solidify strongman rule. Um, the second likely political model is what we call elite bargains in highly unstable and conflict affected contexts where the state does not command a monopoly of violence, providing elites with this preferential access to political privilege or to economic rents is our way to achieve these fragile coalitions to sustain the peace. But I think we could all agree that these political systems don't deliver on the protection of citizens and victims' rights. So how can a standing UN peacekeeping force help support conditions um, that often are counter political conditions that often suppress um, gender and victims' rights? And the first thing I'll argue is around um, the mandates um, for peacekeeping missions. And so we've seen since the passing of WPS 1325 um, that um, gender content in UN peacekeeping missions ha mandates have increased but it's selective and it's not been um, like mainstreamed and it's not systematic. Um, so we know that negotiations of mandates um, is opaque, it elevates above all the need for consent by the warring parties, but we've also seen really committed member states in a global women's civil society movement that's had a notable impact on peacekeeping mandates and their commitment to gender. And this really needs to be built upon. Um, an analysis of UN Security Council resolutions on specific country reveals um, primarily um, language relating to women's protection, um, but a persistent bias against gender equality. Um, and that gender mainstreaming is uh, mandate in mandates is often ad hoc and usually occurs in conflicts with there have been high levels of conflict related sexual violence, but not in other contexts. Um, so I think that the architecture around a permanent peacekeeping force committed to gender mainstreaming and gender equality admissions writ large could do much to mainstream gender equality systematically throughout mission man mandates. Um, first, there would be, uh, and in doing so, this would influence peace outcomes as well as political outcomes as well. First, there would be rhetorical commitments to political outcomes other than strongman rule and elite bargain bargains by mainstreaming gender through all aspects of the mandate. And then we know that mission priorities and programs do follow mandates if they could be actualized. Um, the other area I think that actually falls out nicely with Madeline's talk that I was going to talk about is that then what could permanent um, peacekeeping um, units uh, do in terms of the implementation of local peace and security processes. And what we see right now is sort of a movement by the UN um, in terms of considering these expansive peacekeeping mandates and top-down technical stand, uh, state building approaches for a real focus on the political economy of conflict, just like Madeline said, and how do we create the conditions for peace by managing political power relationships on the ground. And I would say if this is the direction of UN peacekeeping, that it's really imperative that any permanent UN peacekeeping force be adept at um, gender political analysis. And what do I mean by that? 
which is that peacekeepers need to be adept at understanding how gender has shaped access to political power and conflict, and how political power um, in peace um, is also being affected. And just a few ways that the gender-informed um, uh, um, political economy analysis would look like, I think, in action. Um, it gets a little bit to security sector reform. Um, so we know from research by USIP's Resolve Network and other um, research uh, efforts that women's role in security groups are diverse and extensive. Um, they recruit men, they, they affirm men's choices to participate in armed conflict, they fund conflict, uh, conflict groups, um, and they are combatants. We also know that women's participation in armed groups has salut salutary effects. Um, those groups with women in them are less likely to combat violence against civilians and conflict-related sexual violence um, and to negotiate with communities rather than to extort them. Not completely, but in general, um, this is true. But after war, male leaders often devalue women's contributions to armed groups in order to secure their own political so the ability of peacekeeping units to understand, articulate, and elevate the role that women play as security actors is absolutely critical to security sector reform, and I see it in two ways. Um, number one, that um, in terms of security sector reform um, and women's participation in security institutions, there's usually a national security bias that women just aren't gonna be up to these roles. But yet, if we can demonstrate that women are powerful security actors in conflict, this can go a long way. And we can also demonstrate how women curb the excesses and exploitation of security forces and improve their professionalism. Um, the same is true for women as conflict resistors on the ground. We do know that women play powerful roles in resisting conflict um, through collective action, um, through women's rights organization, but again, male leaders will often downplay um, the roles of women. Um, and I think in terms of political economy analysis, the imperative um, to um, elevate women's roles as conflict resistors to provide them agency and, and legitimacy in any political transition. Um, and finally, um, at the local level, um, I think as well, um, we need to understand the political economy of violence against women in post-conflict situations. Um, we often see violence against women in post-conflict as sort of the hangover of the previous violent conflict or society trying to right itself. But at NBI, we recognize that violence against women post-conflict or the failure to achieve accountability for CRSV is in fact a political strategy by political actors to chill women's political participation. Um, so PKOs have made great strides on protection, but more needs to be done on accountability and CRSV, not just for peace, but for governance goals of participation. Um, and then the final thing I would say um, to any permanent peacekeeping unit um, is that while peacekeeping missions are increasingly committed to ending sexual violence against women, um, we must become equally aware of and committed to new forms of violence against women, such as online, online violence. Um, this online violence, um, if we do a political economy analysis, it is meant to drive women out of public life, while also sending a message that women in general should not be involved in politics. PKOs can lead the way, establishing proactive systems to prevent, manage, and remove online hate speech and, and harassment against women. And then the final thing I'll say is that, you know, if peacekeeping really is moving towards um, a situation where they're trying to create the conditions um, of peace and the political conditions rather than these large institution state building missions, then gender um, mainstreaming should be incorporated in all of these activities, whether it is ceasefires, um, you know, monitoring peace implementation. But the last thing I want to say is that I think gender equality is the condition <laughs> to create peaceful outcomes. Um, and so gender equality needs to be prioritized um, within that set of activities in terms of creating peaceful outcomes. Thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, I'm reminded that for, for 40 years, um, NDI has been putting together the links in that evolutionary chain. I don't know if anyone in the room, we've got a lot of NDI folks here, 
so the Central and Eastern Europe team, but that's where I began. Um, and at that point, uh, Gusto had mentioned the Good Friday Agreement, brought women leaders um, of the negotiators from the Good Friday Agreement um, to Kosovo, where I was at that point, uh, working with the Women's Caucus there on what post-conflict justice and democratic processes that were gender inclusive might look like. Um, to introduce our next two speakers, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, the Interim Executive Director and Director of Programs from our partner organization, the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. And I'll ask um, my colleague who's running the online portion to drop into the chat information about both of our organizations and how you can contribute to their causes, uh, both of which, by the way, incidentally, were founded by, among other, uh, Interalia Albert Einstein. Um, so with that, um, Alan Ware, um, if you would like to introduce our next two speaker, our next speaker, please. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, so my name is Alan Ware. Um, I've been with the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy for nearly a year now and really appreciating being involved in an organisation which is looking at global governance mechanisms in order to ensure we have better protect protection of humanity and the planet. Um, and the proposal for United Nations Emergency uh, uh, Unit, uh, which is part of the discussions today, is, is one of those as are many others that go along hand, hand with that. As Augusta mentioned in the introduction, you know, global governance is a range of different mechanisms working together. Some more political, some implementation, some disarmament, some on the judicial order, uh, such as the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, um, and these things are working together. Today, of course, we're focusing very much on UN peacekeeping and its improvement, and we're very happy to be part of this discussion. I also feel very privileged to introduce the next speaker, because he's from my home country, Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and that's Major Alistair Plummer, who's now retired, um, who's joining us online uh, from our home country. He was a senior commander of the Bougainville Truce Monitoring Group. Now, if you haven't heard of Bougainville, it's in the Pacific. It's islands are part of Papua New Guinea, um, and there was a 10-year-long civil war there that started over primarily environmental issues. What Major Alistair Plimmer will be talking about is the importance of both gender and cultural approaches in helping to resolve that process and forging a sustainable solution to that. Uh, Major Plimmer was also part of the United Nations mission in Sierra Leone, and he'll also be talking a bit about the experience there um, and giving some comparisons of those experiences. Major Plimmer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alan. It's, uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, and to my fellow panel members, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, if I could just say, I I, um, I made some notes before I started uh, when I when I got the invitation, and some of the headlines I had was the things along like rapid response force, existing political and social structures in the countries, um, the issue of UN policies not being enforced, um, and an issue of um, a professional force versus a conscript force. Um, and a lot of those things have been touched on today, but I, I suppose, uh, and I've made some notes as we've been going, and Madeline's um, presentation, I thought, resonated with me for a number of reasons, and some of those I'll touch on. Um, but I suppose the first thing to really understand about military conflict, <coughs> excuse me, is that no two conflicts are the same. Um, and um, there is a very fundamental difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Um, and structures that do one are not necessarily going to be available to do another. Um, and that sort of leads into the issue of a, a rapid response force uh, as to what are you what what is the intent of that force? Is it to make peace or is it to en ensure that the conditions of peace are maintained? And to do that, the structures of those forces would be very different. Um, and would also depend on the country in which you're going into and what the in initial, or what the existing political and social structures are. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the differences between the peace, uh, the truce making in Bougainville and um, and in the United Nations and Sierra Leone. Uh, interestingly, I was also uh, spent a year in the Middle East with the United Nations Truce Supervisory Organization uh, in Sierra Leone, in uh, the Golan Heights and South Lebanon, uh, which is quite topical at the moment, as everybody knows. Um, if I could uh, also just make another comment that um, it seems to me that we have forgotten the lessons from the end of the Second World War about um, rebuilding countries after conflict. Um, and if you look at the um, 
uh, Iraq war uh, in the 1990s, um, the efforts to rebuild that country seemed to completely cast aside all the lessons that were learned about rebuilding after Nazi Germany and in Japan and start rewriting the book. And of course, as we all know, it's completely failed. Um, and we've got a, effectively a failed society there now. Um, I think the other critical thing before I get on to specifics is that uh, what is really interesting in, in any situation is there actually needs to be, amongst the warring factions, an actual desire for peace. That is absolutely critical. And if the, if the warring factions uh, don't trust each other and don't want peace, it doesn't matter how many military forces you put in there or whatever you do, it will not succeed. And you just have to look at the fact that the the MFO and UNSO have been going since um, oh, since Adam was a boy, I think. Uh, and there is no end in sight to those UN missions. Uh, and if anybody says there is a desire for peace in the Middle East between the different factions, I think you need to go and have a look on the ground because there really isn't. If I come to Bougainville, um, the, the issue that really resonates with me, uh, and Madeline talked about it, um, is the issue of power. Um, Bougainville, for us, was very much uh, a situation where our diplomats under Don McKinnon and John Hayes had created an atmosphere, um, I think, where, excuse me, where the people of Bougainville themselves had just had enough. Um, and, and it was largely led because Bougainville is a matriarchal society where the women actually owned the land and uh, owned a lot of the structures. And so we're in absolutely integral into the political environment in which we were going into. Um, and to suggest that you could do something without the women, uh, the, the situation would have failed completely. Um, the, and, the, and the issue about um, military forces coming in and dominating an area, as Madeline talked about, she's absolutely right. Um, in Bougainville, um, the issue of guns was highly conf uh, contentious. Um, and we made a decision from a New Zealand perspective under Roger Mortlock, and I have to say that Brigadier Mortlock was a genius in the way he designed this, was there were no guns on the island from us at all uh, in the entire time. No weapons of any sort were taken onto the island. Uh, but that's not entirely true because the weapons we took were basically soccer balls and rugby balls. Uh, when the plane landed uh, and the back of the Hercules opened, the local people were terrified that there was going to be an armed militia come out of the back of that aircraft. The first person off that aircraft was a Lance Corporal female carrying a soccer ball. Uh, and I think the, the, the impact of that on the local community can't be underestimated because the first people to welcome us were little kids. They ran out from the bush. Um, and if any of you have ever seen Bougainville or any of the, uh, the Pacific Islands where they have airstrips, the jungle literally comes up to the side of the airstrip. So all the population was sitting in the jungle, fearful of what was going to come out of that aircraft. And here comes a, a large corporal female with long hair carrying a soccer ball. Uh, the, the visual impact of that, it's very hard to describe, but the impact of that across the community of Bougainville was instantaneous because the kids came running out of the bush to kick the ball around. Some of these kids had never seen a soccer ball. So, um, and and then we spread out across the island in small groups, living in the villages, just encouraging the villagers to talk amongst themselves because the Bougainville conflict, like many civil wars, pitted one side of a village against another. Families were torn apart but because they were on different sides and so on. And so, the, so what we enabled I suppose, was the belief that you could actually achieve things through talking rather than through force. The difference to that and um, Sierra Leone, and, and it might be quite confrontational what I say, um, Sierra Leone, um, I think we, we gave the um, combatants in Sierra Leone a political um, reality that didn't exist. Um, I think we need to be very honest with ourselves and say that the conflict in Sierra Leone was the greatest diamond heist in history. Um, it had nothing to do with political power. It had everything to do with stealing resources. Um, and we gave the um, the combatants there um, a political life that they actually didn't deserve. Um, 
and there, there was no peace there. That was trying to enforce a peace amongst people who actually didn't have a political aim or a political agenda. And so you were effectively dealing with bandits as opposed to politicians and leaders. Um, so, you know, that, that makes a very big difference. The issue of the, that I was going to talk about political and social structures then comes in because in um, many Pacific nations, women have a, a ingrained role within society. And Madeline touched on this a little bit, and I think she was absolutely right. Uh, and so, Mr. Chair, so did you when you talked about the issue of gender in the militaries and gender in politics and so on. Um, when we look at conflicts around the world now, um, you are absolutely right that where women are not represented in political establishments, not represented in, in all the different structures within a society, civil war or nasty conflict is much more likely. Where women are treated as second-rate citizens or chattels because of the beliefs of that country, uh, the civil war is is so much more likely and it is so much more difficult to solve because you have a, a disenfranchised 50 percent of the population are dis disenfranchised um, and we shouldn't uh, we we shouldn't underestimate that um, and i find it really interesting um, when i do these things and um, when i look around the panel and look around uh, it is very much a and we need it's uncomfortable but we need to look at ourselves and say when we look around the panel we are white western world people now we are not the ones who are causing conflicts or having civil wars because we have these structures within our society where women are equal where women have a voice uh, where we where we understand that we can have political disagreements but we get over those by talking now that's not the same in the other half of the world uh, and we don't have those people represented around this forum as far as i can see now that might be a little bit uncomfortable but i think we need to acknowledge that because unless we can change the way that 50 percent of the world thinks uh, then what are we doing um the other the other thing that i would talk about when we talk about a a standing un force we have to deal with um some of the other issues that madeline talked about and that's the issue of sovereignty uh, and the issue of who is responsible. Um, and this comes back to the UN policies not being enforced. And, and history teaches us a lot. And when I, when I look from a New Zealand and Australian perspective, um, we made a decision in the First World War to never again give sovereignty of our forces to another country. And I think many countries probably agree with that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think our society would accept um, the disciplining of um, our forces by a third country. Um, America is in that position. They they haven't signed up to the um, to the international court. Um, New Zealand has, I, I understand, but the issues there um, become real when we talk about um, adopting UN policies and enforcing them. Some countries do a lot better, and um, we we if I if I use Sierra Leone as an example, um, when forces deploy with the UN, uh, we are supposed to have medicals and blood tests and so on and so forth. Well, I can tell you categorically that that didn't occur in, with UNAMSL. Um, and it's proven out by the, the issue of HIV and AIDS in uh, Sierra Leone. Um, it's a country that had a, a one of the lowest rates of AIDS before the war started, and at the end of the war had one of the highest rates. Um, and the only factor that I can determine that caused that was the involvement of peacekeeping forces because of the way that um, they behaved. And Madeline was absolutely right about the attitudes of certain soldiers towards women. Um, and I think that country, um, unfortunately, is going to suffer from that disease for many, many years to come and has, has a major impact on its restructure and its, its ability to survive as a nation, I suppose. And so sex, sexual exploitation is a huge issue. Uh, and it, um, whilst we probably look at um, Bogan, uh, sorry, um, Bosnia as an um, example, again, we're looking at it through a white Western lens. And I think we forget that in a lot of the conflict zones which are occurring in Africa and the Middle East, there is that gender bias and that issue of sexual exploitation is critical to the warring factions. 
Um, the, the other issue I would talk about in Bougainville, um, which while I was there, the, the issue of sex, sexual exploitation was not a really underlying determining factor in that war. Um, and again, I, I think it comes back to the existing political and social structures that occurred in the island um, and the position that women were held within the island. Uh, yes, there were issues of rape and yes, there were issues of sexual exploitation, but it wasn't a determining factor. It wasn't a fundamental factor in the in the conflict like it is in a lot of other areas. Um, so, yeah, so those, those are really the issues that I would talk about. And finally, I think the, the issue, if you, if you believe in a rapid response force, um, you have to ask, you know, again, what is it going to do? Um, and one of the one of the things we need to remember is that the militaries are about the application of force. That's why they exist. They are a political tool to achieve a political aim. To do so, they need to be highly trained. Um, they need to be ready to adapt to any situation you do. And so to, to do that, you train for the worst that you can find. You try to train your military forces to fight a full conflict, and from that you can step down. If you try to train peacekeeping, that means your forces will not be trained to react to the worst situation. They will be under-trained, under-equipped, um, and not ready. So that's the other issue that you need to talk about. And, and what happens, of course, is when you have professionals versus conscript, if you've got a conscript army, which a, which a number of countries do, um, you will be forever changing the structure of that ready reaction force. And so it won't be prepared for what it may, may determine to go into. Uh, so that's really, um, I suppose, um, all, all I really need to say at this stage. Um, I hope that's not too confrontational. Um, but I think when, when we look at these things, the issue of, of gender within society is critical and it will determine the makeup and the success of an operation. Um, Bougainville was a huge success because of the structure of women in society and the way that um, our diplomats from New Zealand and Australia and our military force from New Zealand and Australia reacted to that environment. Um, and I think I look back with pride on that one. I don't look back on pride with the other ones I was involved with too much um, because either they're still ongoing or um, the the effects on the country that the that the force had are still being resonated today. So I hope, I hope that sort of gives a bit of an insight. Major Plymouth, thank you very much for your uh, comments, raising a number of issues of gender, cultural and political aspects of both peacekeeping and peacemaking and distinctions between those, um, and also some very important points about the different conflicts, different nature of conflicts require different types of responses. So there's a lot of uh, details, uh, nuances and things that you raise, particularly if we're looking at a rapid response unit. These are very, very helpful. Um, for those of you who want to find out more about the Bougainville uh, experience, the documentary Soldiers Without Guns, which is available on YouTube, is actually a really good documentary, which goes a little bit deeper uh, into the cultural uh, aspects, the gender aspects, which Major Plum was talking about, um, how the peacekeeping or the monitoring unit uh, incorporated those uh, that awareness in the, the way that it operated and how that built the success in that situation. So Soldiers Without Guns is a documentary, and we put the URL to that, those of you who are online. Um, and thank you also for joining us so very early from New Zealand, Major. And our final uh, panelist, uh, also online, is uh, Valeria Barbara, who is a legal and advocacy officer at Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice, uh, where she advocates globally for gender justice and accountability for sexual and gender-based crimes, including in peace negotiations and justice processes. So she will look at some multi-pronged approaches uh, to these issues. Uh, Valeria, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks to, uh, for the invitation to contribute to this timely discussion. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Uh, otherwise, please notify me and I'll, um, I'll, I'll try to change the settings. Uh, so I would like to start with a general reflection that the, any, any endeavor to reform UN peacekeeping and any um, 
any effort uh, towards peacekeeping missions must be rooted in the recognition that peace is not merely about the absence of war, but also about the presence of justice and respect for human rights. And as such, there can be no peace without respect um, uh, for rights of women, but also all those affected by intersectional vulnerabilities, including but not limited to gender. We're all also talking about uh, such grounds of discrimination or of vulnerability as race, uh, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, etc. So we heard earlier uh, accounts about less successful peacekeeping missions. We also heard about some successful approaches and advances, which we welcome. Yet these are not uniform across uh, missions. And I couldn't agree more with uh, the previous speaker that no two contexts are the same. And thus responses um, should be context-informed uh, context and context-based. Uh, but I uh, think you would agree with me that in terms of inclusion and respect for human rights, we must strive for consistency and uh, improvement. And it's imperative uh, from our view to incorporate an inclusive and victim-sensitive perspective in US peacekeeping efforts. And this, uh, this approach must not only address past failure, failures, but also anticipate the needs of local communities um, to prevent re-traumatization and ensure lasting peace. So in my intervention today, I'll, I'll share some general suggestions for a cross-sectoral approach um, to addressing um, not only gender challenges, but intersectional challenges faced um, in peacekeeping context. So Firstly, a key aspect is to ensure that gender responsive uh, leadership is not just about promoting gender parity uh, or parity uh, and representation, but it, it's also about transforming the culture of peacekeeping to be truly inclusive and intersection. So a good guideline might be the, the UN gender responsive peacekeeping operations policy, which goes beyond a mere increase in the number of women in peacekeeping, but also gives guidance on how to transform culture within uh, peacekeeping operations to be more inclusive and responsive uh, to, to the needs all, of all actors involved. And um, focal points who serve as technical uh, experts can support the coordination of inclusive strategies across uh, all actors, civilian, police, and military components in uh, peacekeeping missions. Secondly, uh, training and mentorship programs should be in, in place that equip peacekeepers with uh, the skills to address the complex realities of gender and intersectionality in conflict zones, and even in cases where peacekeepers might be familiar with some of the aspects um, of the conf conflict zone that they are operating in, it's still crucial for them to enhance knowledge and skills on, on um, the intersecting um, vulnerabilities uh, which might, might have pre-existed in a society uh, and might have been exacerbated by conflict and how these intersects and intersect in the life, lives of civilians and other parties involved. Um, so the UN provides specialized training materials and, uh, and reinforcement uh, training packages and um, it's important um, to, to make sure these are implemented widely and uniformly. And it's especially important to implement this for uh, leaders such as UN force commanders, deputy force commanders, but also leaders at, at all levels. Thirdly, where appropriate, uh, it's important to strengthen and implement uniformly accountability frameworks to address and uh, prevent sexual exploitation and abuse by UN personnel as we heard that this uh, is a problem before. So as per the UN sexual abuse and um, sexual exploitation and abuse accountability framework, there should be clear lines of accountability and action for addressing allegations with specific roles designated for uh, relevant bodies that exist within the missions, including pre mission planning um, and uh, preparation for, uh, to, uh, to in mission, vetting and screening, as well as uh, immediate victim assistance and investigation procedures. And finally, peacekeeping missions should uh, engage in continuous dialogue with local communities to understand and respond to their specific needs and ensure that peacekeeping efforts are culturally sensitive and uh, victim centric. And a good example of such a collaboration um, is uh, the Women in Peacebuilding Network in Liberia, which played a crucial role in ending the civil war and addressing uh, sexual violence. So they engaged communities in peacebuilding efforts and advocated for the rights of uh, survivors, demonstrating the importance of uh, local voices and perspectives. But we've heard some other good examples uh, earlier uh, 
today. So for such initiatives to be in, impactful, they must be underpinned by genuine commitment and empowered by leadership at all levels, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, an inclusive approach is not just about representation, meeting quotas, or uh, meeting some superficial uh, uh, changes, but it's about, about fostering a, a deep cultural shift uh, that values uh, diversity and inclus inclusivity. And such transformation requires time and sustained effort, um, and it, it involves continuous learning, growth, and the willingness to challenge and uh, to change some entrenched be behaviors and norms. So, for example, in the context of a gender responsive peacekeeping, as I already mentioned, is not enough to simply increase the number of women in peacekeeping forces, but there might, must also be an environment where their contributions are valued, where there's a zero, zero tolerance for discrimination or harassment, where their perspectives are integral to decision making processes. And this requires leaders who not only advocate for these values, but also embody them in their actions and, and policies. And leaders are key in the implementation of cross-sectoral change, of course. They must demonstrate their own growth and development and encourage even the most nuanced uh, cultural shifts and understanding of uh, context-based uh, approaches and must be uh, prepared to resource and support such transformative uh, initiatives over the long term uh, as, as such initiatives take often take years to fully realize. So to conclude, we've noted some examples of best practices um, and policies which demonstrate the sy system's commitment to transforming uh, the culture of peacekeeping. Um, but for future in initiatives to be truly impactful, they must be genuine and empowered by committed leadership with the understanding that uh, cultural change is a long-term process that requires patience, uh, dedication, and a strategic approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valeria. And as we move now to the discussion portion of our program, and we've had a few questions come in online, please do use that Q&A function. Um, we'll also take some in the room. Um, I'd like to reflect that um, as we move from lessons learned to the way forward, we are at perhaps what might be a watershed moment um, in terms of UN reform and the opportunity for innovation with the upcoming Summit for the Future and the civil society consultations thereof come upcoming in Nairobi in just a few months in, in May. And one of the proposals that has been included in the, inter in, in the People's Pact for the Future is the proposal for um, a UN Emergency Peace Service. Um, we'll put a link to our website where you can learn more about that proposal. And we're also honored, I see uh, joining us online as one of the, the founding fathers of the UNEPS Initiative. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it first to questions or comments from the room. And kindly, if you could introduce yourself and your affiliation as you do so, please don't be shy. Do I see any hands? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Christina. I'm from the Georgetown Institute for Peace and Security. I work there as a research fellow. Um, a lot of my recent research has focused on masculinity in peace building. And so I wanted to ask and slash comment on kind of the role of not only women, but also gender broadly. Uh, in peacekeeping. So our research was in Mindanao in the Philippines, which is also a case where uh, we say that peacekeeping and peace building has been very successful. But when we look on the ground, there still kind of remains a lot to be done in establishing long-term gender equality, particularly within um, governance structures and things like that. And one of the things that we found was that this idea of masculinity is one of the things that persists in making it very difficult to achieve gender equality, because even if you empower women, but do nothing to change men's beliefs about women, then it's very difficult for, for successes to be made, right? So there was a lot of efforts to give women increased economic opportunities, but no efforts to uh, encourage men to help with reproductive labor in the home, which then in, ended up having lots of burden added to women rather than you know empowering them. We also saw that within um, peace operations, men believe that women should participate, but should not be allowed to lead. Um, because of kind of entrenched beliefs about where women belong within um, peacekeeping forces. So I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts on how we can really adopt this idea of not only including women, but adopting a fully like gendered approach and not just assuming that gender means women. Thank you very much. We'll take one more from the floor um, and then any of our panelists who'd like to answer these two questions. Richard, please. Uh, Richard Ponzi from the Center here in Washington. And uh, two-part question for uh, Major Plimmer, but 
for any of the panelists who should speak to women, peace, and security. Uh, it came about in the 2000 UN Security Council resolution before the Bougainville conflict. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, one of the key issues, women at the negotiating table, was that part of it you talked about women having influence as landowners, uh, but uh, both in Bougainville and then, of course, the army of Papua New Guinea, what role did women play in the formal peace negotiations? But secondly, on the rapid response uh, idea, um, I have experienced and learned from Bougainville in the Solomon Islands with the UN when uh, the New Zealand and Australian-led regional assistance mission to the UN came into the Solomon Islands a few years after the Bougainville conflict. Is that the type of model you have in mind for a rapid response, or does it need to be under a UN flag? What do you think of ideas about a truly volunteer force uh, disassociated with national militaries? Thanks. And, and Richard is well known to many of us, but Richard Ponzio from the Global Governance Innovation Network Stimson Center, who's doing your person's work um, with the Coalition for the UN We Need as part of the Summer of the Future process. Um, did any of our panelists first have reflections on the question of gender as more than a binary consideration um, in these conversations? And I'm, uh, I recollect that we have both Valeria and Major Plimmer um, joining us remotely, unfortunately not Ms. Rees, um, and Lauren and um, Augusto here in the room. Yeah, I find your question very captivating, very interesting. It addresses, I think, indirectly the question of how does one change mentality? Right? And I have one example, which I have I think sometimes referred to, which I think is very encouraging and then in terms of the things that one can do that over time actually change the mentality and the culture of gender discrimination. And this comes from India. It'll take me one minute to give you the basic data. In the 1990s, the Indian government decided to make it optional for the states, remember this is a federal country, for the states to introduce um, a 30% quota for women's participation in village councils. Some states did it, others didn't. And so 10 years later, a team of World Bank and other academic experts went back to India to see whether one could actually see any changes on the ground in terms of uh, you know, the introduction of quota. Two things were discovered. One was that in those uh, states that had introduced the, the quota and were there for the participation of women, yeah, the decision-making level was you know, much greater, um, the structure of spending within the village councils had changed in a fairly dramatic way. There was a great deal more spending on education, mm -hmm. on public health, building water wells and other infrastructures that contributed to, to improve the quality of, the, of life in the community. Whereas in the, in the states that hadn't, it was different. More, more spending on, on, you know, sort of sports stadiums and national festivities and holidays and that sort of thing. What was really interesting is that when the quota was introduced, there was a lot of hostility on the part of men. Because remember, you know, this is a country where that has the biggest pocket of illiteracy in the world. So there was a, a skepticism behind the work of that. They, they were, you know, what are illiterate women going to contribute you know, at the level of the village council, even though they, they themselves were very, very illiterate. Right? Ten years later, um, there was a great deal of um, uh, sort of support among men for the idea that women should participate in the village council. They had actually seen that the system did not impose, that actually it brought many benefits to, to the quality of life in the community. Men were much more relaxed and, and open to the idea that they should participate. And so over a decade, there was this change of mentality where men were actually realized, actually, you know, this is a good thing for our society. And, you know, the kind of data that has accumulated over the last 20, 30 years about the importance of women in corporate workers, for instance, the IMF has done a couple of studies highlighting the importance of women on the boards of institution, the bank, banking institutions, financial institutions, showing that where they are present in greater numbers, you know, the financial system is much more resilient, and better, better able to deal with shocks. Um, I mean, the evidence is just overwhelming, and I think that we should use it. We should use it. We should highlight it. Right? This isn't just a question of principle the evidence that has piled up in terms of the consequences associated with uh, 
bringing women into decision making places. It's just, it's just very, very possible. Because that's one way to change this, this mental frameworks, which, which sometimes are so resist, resistant to change. Very briefly on that, Yes, I mean, we ourselves incorporate masculinity training, but I would just add more and more angle to that is masculinity training is actually critical as well for transitioning men who have been defined by violence, right? That is masculine, you know, violence defines masculinity. Um, so to that extent, addressing the violence against men, to your point, to broaden it, um, there's been a relief among men that they can move out of these sort of stereotypes of men as violent individuals and breaking that silence of that cycle of violence against men, which is very all important. Major Plummer, did you want to respond to Richard's comments? I see your hand. Uh, yeah, thank you. There were <coughs> excuse me, two parts to the question, really. Um, first one about the role of the women in the peace and the um, the peacemaking uh, and the negotiations. Uh, they were absolutely critical. Um, and um, Helen probably remembers the the Burnham Peace Accord that was signed, um, where Don McKinnon arranged for a Hercules load of the combatants, male and female to come down to Burnham in the middle of winter. Um, Burnham is in the South Island of New Zealand, which is bitterly cold. Uh, and when we brought the combatants from Bougainville to Burnham, uh, they were more interested in keeping warm than they were actually in discussing the, the conflict. So it was actually a really um, fun <laughs> environment in which they could um, actually get together and, and combat the common foe, which was the cold weather of Burnham, to come up with solutions that, that made a difference difference for them in the islands where it was 35 degrees. Um, but the women were absolutely critical through that process. Um, and, and they were at the table all the way. In terms of um, the peacekeeping structures, um, I think when you when you look at what happens in the Pacific, a regional approach is very, very good. Because Australia and New Zealand, uh, whilst being the, the dominant militaries in the South Pacific, um, we are still very much Pacific nations, and probably more so New Zealand than Australia. But we um, have a very close relationship with our island cousins. Um, and so you end up with a very Pacific flavour that um, gives a means by which it's not a it's not a power from a different culture coming into the Pacific to establish the the basics for lasting peace. It is very much, a Pacific solution for Pacific people. That works, I think, because um, the structures, as I talked about, the political and social structures within the Pacific, women are fully ingrained in those structures across all the islands. Um, democracy is well rooted across the islands. Um, and whilst we have conflicts in Fiji and Solomon Islands and Bougainville, um, they tend not to be um, massively political constructs, but more, um, for want of a better term, more family arguments that sort of blow up a little bit. Um, if you look at Bougainville, for example, that was an issue of land ownership um, and and the the use of resources going outside of the people of Bougainville. So it became it was a, it was an internal discussion about how does our society work. Not a, it wasn't a political fight. Um, and, and the same in the Solomon Islands and the same in Fiji. There were some structural issues that, that they were resolving there. I don't think the same could be said for some of our other conflict zones. Where, um, and I make the point that where you establish your regional forces, if you bring in regional forces who have the same fundamental beliefs towards women um, as to the structure in which you're going into, you will either have success or you will import more of the same problems. Um, so if, and this will be very confrontational, I suppose. Um, if you bring in peacekeeping forces in Africa, as it happened in Sierra Leone, where women were treated as second-rate citizens, and you bring in forces from Africa where women are treated as second-rate citizens, you just bring in more of the same problem. You don't actually bring in any educational ability or whatever. So you maintain the status quo, which means then 
you're going to end up with the same problem down the track further. Um, and in Sierra Leone, the problem was exacerbated because of the disease that came with that same cultural um, beliefs from the initial African forces and then the UN forces that came on top of that. If you bring 13,000 um, troops who have structural issues about women in their own countries, bring them into a, a, another country, you're just going to import that problem. So it, it is a little bit more difficult than saying regional forces work very, very well. Uh, in the Pacific and South Pacific, yes, it does work well, and it has worked very, very well and enabled Australia and New Zealand and Fiji predominantly to structure their forces to suit the different um, issues that we've faced. That same issue doesn't occur in Africa and doesn't occur in the Middle East, where the where the bulk of our conflicts are now. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Major. Um, I, I'm mindful that we're out of time with NDI's largesse. I hope we can go a few minutes over to hear first from Valeria, her response to those questions, and then take a few of the questions that we've had online. And uh, thanks to Alan for combing through the embarrassment of riches. I, I apologize, I'm not sure we'll have, have time to get to everybody who's made a comment online, um, but I commend all of you to look at the Q&A if, you, if you're online and, and to uh, see some of those comments. Valeria, over to you. Yes, I'll just make a, sm a small addition here that it might be useful to uh, change the way you analyze a situation from a single axis of discrimination, uh, such as gender, to intersectional um, or more, more just when you examine a situation, it's useful to look for all possible grounds of discrimination or all vul vulnerabilities that might exist in a uh, certain conflict and also pre-existing the conflict. So what was the state of the society before the conflict has arisen? And uh, once you do that, and I, I can understand that this is uh, an interesting point of view coming from um, an NGO who advocates for gender justice. So this is still a single axis, but we've found in, um, uh, yeah, in some recent uh, research that we did that um, looking at multiple grounds of discrimination and interest and uh, how these um these grounds might intersect um it just gives a um opportunity for a much more complex response uh to to crimes and uh, to conflict thank you thank you valeria um over to alan okay there are about 10 questions online i'm sorry we're not going to be able to answer them all um one of them i'll just say had a bit of information so i'll just say this first and then I'll take two of the questions, which seem to have some resonance. Um, from Tad Daly did indicate that there is a, um, a publication coming out very soon from the Scowcroft Institute at the Bush School of Government uh, on hypothetical future United Nations Peace Force. So it'll be in that volume, we'll be exploring some of these issues in articles. So watch out for that when it comes. And I guess we'll be giving a notice about it when it's published. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Our newsletters, the uh, Citizens for Global Solutions and World Terrorist Movement. Um, on the couple of questions, there was one from Keith Best, which sort of follows up a little bit from the Major Plymouth's comments about firstly why how the Bougainville uh, situation worked very well with the inclusion of women because women had such a prominent role in society. But what about in societies where women don't have such a prominent role and there's a lot of discrimination? What is the dynamics there? And I think, Major Plumber, you started answering that when you said then you don't want to import the same sort of problem that's already there and add to it, but that the what the approach should be educative as well as fitting in. Can you sort of expand on that a little bit more um, when you have a peacekeeping uh, coming into societies that are very discriminatory against women? How does that dynamic work in, in incorporating women in the processes? Uh, a little bit more on, on whether it can work when it's a very discriminatory society. So that's the first question. I'll say the second question also before we move on. And the second question uh, was from Dr. Sabrina White from Transparency International. And that's relating to the issues of corruption uh, in peacekeeping forces and in the societies that the peacekeeping forces are entering into. Um, and what other ways are, is it possible to address and bring in elements of anti-corruption or opposing the corruption or transforming the corruption 
in that peacekeeping process? Is there cooperation in peacekeeping with some of the initiatives in anti-corruption? Okay, so the first one I think is to Major Plimmer. The second one could be to any of the panelists. Maybe Augusto may take it first. Yeah. And Lauren, yes, of course. Yeah. So Major Plimmer first. Oh boy, that's the that's the fifty thousand dollar question, isn't it? How do you how do you change uh, the ingrained belief of a society? Um, and um, firstly, I, I would say the role of the military. That's not the role of the military. The role of the military is to create the um, the um, the struct. I suppose the <clears throat> to create the uh, the atmosphere in which the politicians can do their work. Um, and the educators. It comes down to education. It comes down to understanding the benefits of how you do that. Now, religion plays a huge part in this because there are religious beliefs that um, ingrained for hundreds of years. Now, how do you change those within a society to say women have a much more productive role? Well, again, that's not the role of the military. The military is to create the establishment where um, other organisations, be the NGOs or be the politicians, to talk about those issues. Um, if, if we could answer the question about how do you change those, those societal structures and societal beliefs, well, we probably wouldn't have this panel um, because it is the fundamental question, isn't it? How do you how do you change a society's belief that has led them to have a conflict? Um, I, I, I don't know if there is an answer yet apart from education. Um, you know, education is the, is the answer to almost everything. Uh, and when you look at the conflicts across Africa and the Middle East, one of the underlying factors is the level of education in those countries. It's very low. You know, highly educated societies generally don't go to war because they see the they see the um, pointlessness of it. And so maybe maybe that's where we start is actually looking at at the education, and it will be generations before we change it, probably. But you have to start somewhere. Thank you, Major. From now to Lauren and Augusto for the other question about the um, engagement in anti-corruption measures as well. And then we have a couple more uh, comments from the floor as well after that. On corruption? Okay. Um, I mean, this is a very, very complex subject, obviously, but, but economists looking at the experience of, you know, policies that have more or less dealt successfully with the issue of corruption in, in, you know, in countries, uh, I've come to a conclusion that it's very important to have systems that have two pillars, reward and punishment. Let me give you an example of what that means. In terms of reward, very often you will find corruption, especially in developing countries, because the public officials are poorly paid, because uh, Soldiers in the army uh, have to supplement their income in unofficial ways because they're not well compensated. And so those countries that have tried to bring in systems where um, civil servants, uh, soldiers, and others are fairly compensated in some way, you know, have managed to reduce the incidence of corruption in a, in, in a better way. Right? There are studies that have done at the IMF actually looking at the at the sort of relationship between levels of compensation on the one hand, incidents of corruption. All right, so that's the reward component. In terms of the punishment component, a very good example comes from Singapore. Singapore is a country that has very good rankings in transparency international corruption for countries. Yeah. Uh, Singapore is a little bit like Sweden and Norway, you know, low levels of corruption. Right? Interestingly, it's also one of the countries that has relatively speaking, some of the highest levels of compensation in the public sector. Uh, at the same time, it is one of the countries that has some of the most severe penalties against officials who engage in corruption, notwithstanding their high level. Right? Um, I, I will not go into the details, right? but you don't want to be caught in Singapore uh, stealing from the public purse. Right? You become a non-entity thereafter. Right. There is virtually no possibility of recovering your, your good, good, good name, right? So that's the, the punishment component. Um, I mean, there's a great deal more that could be said, what other countries are doing. Chile has used very successfully the latest technologies, um, you know, to reduce corruption um, by making it 
more kind of making for him public procurement much more much much more transparent. You cannot sell a good or a service to the Chilean government unless you do it through an online portal, which is 100% open and transparent. Right? It's a, a, a big subject, but uh, one of the sort of leading academic experts on issues of corruption is Susan. Susan, I, I can't remember her last name. I apologize. She's a professor at Yale University, and she has built an entire sort of intellectual tradition based on these principles of reward and punishment. You work on both sides, and it works. I mean, the evidence is really quite quite interesting across across many many countries. Susan Rose Ackerman. I was about to Google. Thank you. So I'm I'm a little humbled by responding to a question on corruption from Transparency International, but um, uh, anyway, I would add to this by saying I think in these complex contexts, it's very important to look at the um, how corruption and conflict intersect, um, and that. Um, and I, I can talk about it in a couple of ways. I think when you do a better job, I talked initially about these elite bargains. Well, these elite bargains and rent-seeking arrangements that we favor in these environments lead often to grand corruption. Um, and so we are seeding the grand corruption. Um, so I think there have been a number of innovative ways to help moderate that grand corruption and those rent-seeking behaviors. I know in Liberia, um, government officials were required to get the signature of their international counterparts before letting any. We've seen a lot of innovation on this coming out of Ukraine and contracts, et cetera. Um, but I, I caution that because, you know, in these transitioning countries, there is an illicit war economy that was a survival strategy for people that it often looks corrupt, right? And so you have to be very careful when you attack that method of corruption because you're taking away people's ability to survive the situation they're in. So there's a caution there about, you know, again, conflict and corruption. Um, and then finally, I think that, and this is Rachel Kleinfeld's great work, Savage Order, you have to look at how corruption actually reinforces the political systems of political violence. Um, in the sense that Kleinfeld says corruption, um, the, the political leaders wanted corruption because corruption was a way to corrupt the security actors and fuel the violent conflict, right? So corruption was an enabling factor to violence. And so there it has to be not only looking at technical corruption mechanisms, but looking at the political resolution um, to the corruption because corruption is fueling. Thank you. Um, as we move to our last questions or comments in the room, I would also commend to everybody who's online a few more of the comments in the chat um, from our friends uh, Dr. Emma Hosong um, and uh, Lily Lincoln-Samana up in the Baha'i International Center. And uh, Lily and Emma, please don't be surprised or alarmed if you have a follow-up invite for us to be panelists at a future event like this. Um, Andrea, also, maybe you can put in the chat function uh, a link to uh, Emma's book as well about her experiences with the conflict in Cameroon. So I think we had a couple of thoughts over here. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, so my name is Kate Galaire. I work at the State Department in the Bureau of International Organizations Office of Peacekeeping um, in Fort Madison. Thank you so much for welcoming us to be here because this is the kind of conversation that really does feed into the way that we're thinking about the future of peacekeeping, which is an ongoing topic and discussion. Um, there are many uh, things that I wanted to highlight in terms of how we try to participate as a member state on the Security Council and also as the largest financial contributor to peacekeeping in trying to shape that tool and make sure that it is supporting inclusive peace processes and effectively protecting civilians and that we're holding uh, troop contributors accountable for um, SCA and other misconduct. And there's there's lots to say there, but um, what, I, what I really wanted to talk about was to speak to Major Plimmer's point about the fact that when we're um, imposing uh, you know, national forces on a conflict context, and those forces are sometimes reinforcing some of the root causes of the conflict, that's a challenge. And, and the question was, what can we do to improve that? And I kind of wanted to offer a glimmer of hope because there is one program that we're really proud of at the State Department, which is our Global Peace Operations Initiative, which is managed by our, our political military bureau. 
And I think that that's a great bright spot. And, and it's something that we talked about at the Peacekeeping Ministerial in Ghana in um, December. And we'll discuss it at the next Peacekeeping Ministerial next year. Um, the idea of capacity building partnerships. So GPOI, um, we partner with, I think, around 50 troop and police contributing countries to um, improve their capacity in terms of their equipment, but also training and 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 trying to mainstream gender and, and lots of different um, topics that hopefully improve their performance in the mission, but also indirectly kind of change the composition of their national forces. And this is a way that through the UN, we're trying to push for um, the improvement of national forces throughout so that they can then respond more effectively um, to conflict. Of course, this is a slow process and, and we're met with a lot of challenges, but I, I really um, find comfort in the fact that a lot of the solutions that we're offering are so tangible. Like for instance, one of the, one of the latest projects was to try to provide women peacekeepers with better fitting body armor that, that is not one size fits all. Well, that makes it much safer and more um, possible for women to be participating in peacekeeping missions and to feel like, like they're protected Additionally, I think that um, then increasing women's participation, even if it's from, say, um, say if it's an African troop contributing country deploying to an African mission. Well, then if there are women in that mission that are coming into a context where women are not traditionally in positions of leadership, they're also setting an example and demonstrating what's possible. And so we're trying to see how we can continue to fuel that and, and have that be kind of a uh, uh, how the returns on that can continue to grow exponentially. So um, I just wanted to share a couple of those thoughts and also say that I really appreciate all of the thoughts of the panelists and others who have offered comments and questions in the room because this is very helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to hear about the bright spots. <laughs> uh, very last question. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with everything that my colleague said, but I, I want to pose a question. Uh, some concerns that I've heard about the elevation of women in operations is uh, the, the kind of the lack of burden sharing of, of placing all these uh, these grand ideas onto a singular woman in a, a position of power or a low percentage of women in peacekeeping operations. So I was wondering if you guys could share your thoughts a little bit on some kind of structural changes within missions or the United Nations could to undertake in order to, to help support these women and not necessarily make them as the, uh, the sole arbiter of these uh, initiatives that we're talking about. Unintended consequences. Um, I am trying to see online if we have our panelists' many hands, but uh, Lauren or Augusto, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, I think it gets a little bit to masculinity training we were talking about, right? Um, where male peacekeepers reconceive their contributions, um, you know and cultural issues. Um, but I, I also think, too, you know, it gets to the purpose of the mission, right? Um, and so oftentimes, these are not highly militarized missions. Um, so could we reconceive of what um, gender looks like in these missions um, and, and maybe in some ways ungender the gender, right? Um, that if these missions are about protection, but they're about caring for populations, but they're also about, um, you know, operating in difficult environments. Um, what does that mean in terms of gendered roles and reconfiguring what gender looks like, um, what roles look like um, within those missions? Um, Major Plimmer uh, and Valeria, if you're, if you're still with us, um, would you like to either respond for that question um, and or um, conclude with any final thoughts? Major Plimmer, perhaps over to you, and then Valeria. Yeah, look, I, I have nothing to add to that. Uh, so it is, a, it is a. I, I think it comes down a little bit to mass, um, and when you have one woman waving a flag, she's a target. When you have a million women waving flags, you've got mass and you've got impetus. Um, and you have to get to that stage, but it takes very brave women, I think, to start to put their head above the parapet, as we would say in the military. Um, and we're in that situation. Um, I think the Western world, Western beliefs have proceeded a long way down that track. I think we need to, and I come back to that issue of education. Um, 
but it's a very it is a dangerous place for women to be in countries that don't have that cultural understanding um, and we see it all the time that that prominent women in uh, countries where women don't have a political role um, are targeted um, and that change that gets changed through education not through military strength Thank you, Major Valeria. The last word. Yes, I couldn't agree more about the need to um, for any response to be informed by cultural understanding of of uh, the situation at hand. And uh, then, yeah, my my other major concluding point would be to try and um, and see uh, not only about uh, the gender aspects of a certain conflict and a situation, but to really try and look at all vulnerabilities uh, at hand and uh, and see how those uh, intersect and what what conclusions we can make and what how can we adapt the responses uh, to those conflicts based on uh, on all the factors involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valeria. Um, in conclusion, uh, I would like to to note or uh, recollect that both my organization, Citizens for Global Solutions, and WFM IGP see an effective, sustainable UN peacekeeping solution as an integral part of a democratic world federalist um, government system. Um, and once again, you can learn more about our organizations from the links in the chat. The chat will be saved, including all of these wonderful resources, especially for those of you um, with us in person who were unable to, to see the links online. They will be concluded in a follow-up package. Um, in addition to thanking our esteemed panelists, and really thank you so much for your insight and your time, um, I would also like to thank the team behind the scenes who makes this possible, Kara Joyce at NDI, uh, my colleagues at CGS, uh, Drea Klein Berkman, James May and Alex Andre, and Vanessa Lentain at Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. Um, thanks also to everybody who stayed for um, what has been a longer conversation, but incredibly rich, um, online. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, and I conclude.